And Mitchell was the most original scientist I ever met. For him, it was necessary to understand the world from first principles in a way that I think was unique. Talking with him in his apartment in the middle of the night, interrupted by the squawking of the big bird in the next room, poring over notes on yellow paper and receiving a large dose of secondhand smoke, I felt that Mitchell would have been much happier in the 19th century, where the mathematics he loved the most, complex variables, uh, was developed. Mitchell uh, was an unusual uh, person. Uh, it was particularly remarkable that he was um, in, in, a, in a laboratory for biology and physics. Um, Mitchell's idea of um, nutrition uh, was to exist on a diet of red wine, uh, cigarettes, espresso coffee, and, uh, and steak. Um, I, I can truthfully say that in all the time that I knew Mitchell and met with him and ate, shared time with him, uh, I never saw Mitchell uh, eat a vegetable. Now we're here of course to, to celebrate uh, Mitchell and, and many of his achievements in nonlinear dynamics and, and uh, other areas of, of science. Um, uh, and of course his work is, is very highly cited and highly influential, um, but here's one of his uh, works that I think is probably not as well known. Um, it's called The Cow and I, and uh, again you might think this is extolling the virtues of dry aged uh, rare steak. Uh, but in fact, it's a beautiful uh, essay in a New York intellectual magazine uh, talking about uh, signs and symbols, and in particular talking about uh, where numbers come from. And uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, I don't have time and it's not my topic, but it's a wonderful little essay that without any equations, without anything else, uh, goes into uh, the whole concepts of cardinality and all sorts of things like that. So I'll, I'll get to that uh, a little bit uh, later at the, at the end of my talk. I'll come, I'll come back to this, but I do encourage you uh, to read it. Now, the literature that Mitchell is most well known for is, of course, his work uh, uh, on transitions to chaos. And in the early days, uh, his papers were uh, entitled The Onset Spectrum of Turbulence, uh, Transition to Aperiodic Behavior in Turbulent Systems. And we've, of course, heard uh, from uh, Albert uh, about the seminal contributions he made to that. Uh, later on, he, he talked about uh, period doubling bifurcations and the spectrum for a route to turbulence, because at that point he understood, and everybody did, that uh, there were many different ways that turbulence uh, can be uh, created. Now, I'm going to talk, uh, following uh, Björn Hoff's uh, beautiful talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of that work. I'm going to be talking about what I've called the life and death of, of turbulence, and uh, my collaborators are listed here. Uh, some of them are, uh, are in, in this room. So the, 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 the goal of this talk is to apply uh, statistical mechanics to uh, turbulence, not just the transition, but also fully uh, developed turbulence. And what I want to understand is the qualitative content of the equations of fluid mechanics uh, and understand its phase diagram, and in particular look for universality and scaling laws if, if they exist. And, uh, and what we've been able to do, we meaning the whole community, uh, has been to make novel predictions and perspectives based on statistical mechanics. Uh, first of all, in uh, transitional flows, which is where I'll start, uh, and then in uh, fluctuation dissipation relations for turbulence, which is uh, actually work that uh, we, we did uh, before the transitional work, uh, and, uh, but has recently uh, received very interesting experimental uh, verification. And uh, just to, uh, to let you know what the take home message is, uh, the take home message is, is that really we can think of two types of uh, universality in turbulence. Uh, there is the critical point uh, uh, universality that uh, Bjorn Hoff showed you some of the data on, uh, but also in the uh, above the uh, in the fully developed regime, uh, there are also a uh, unifying concepts of uh, fluctuation dissipation, rare events, and mean flow interactions. And I'll touch on those uh, at the end of the talk. So when I talk about the life and death of turbulence, what I really mean is up here in the Reynolds numbers above, uh, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands, uh, the life of turbulence and the death of turbulence, meaning the uh, turbulent to laminar uh, transition as one goes down uh, in Reynolds number. 
Now, Bjorn Hoff already gave a beautiful introduction uh, to this, so I'm going to go fairly fast over this part. Uh, but basically, uh, what you do is you inject a, um, a disturbance of uh, fluid uh, in, into a, a, a flow that is already uh, hagen Purcell laminar flow. Uh, you watch how the disturbance behaves in time. You do uh, uh, time of flight measurements. And, uh, and what uh, uh, Bjorn uh, did in those experiments in his seminal 2008 paper was measure the, and earlier papers too, I should mention, uh, well, was measure the survival probability of turbulence as a function of time and as a function of Reynolds number. And uh, that has a, is a memoryless process with a lifetime, which is shown uh, over, over here. Now, as you go to higher Reynolds numbers, what happens is that the puffs split and you get a sort of intermittent uh, regime where you get spatial temporal pattern formation. And if you ask for yourself, <coughs> what is the statistics for the time between splitting events? <coughs> Excuse me, you find that that also um, uh, uh, is, a, is a function that uh, uh, decays as you go higher up in Reynolds number. This is an exponential, uh, this is a uh, logarithmic, uh, time on the vertical axis here. So, the, so when you take the double log of this, uh, the, the last refuge of the scandal, but there is a theoretical reason for doing this, uh, you find that the intersection is where you can define the critical Reynolds number. And so as you heard, the, the um, lifetimes, the time scales near the transitional turbulence uh, have this super exponential scaling, which I'll, I'm going to say very little about uh, in, the, in the talk. Now, we wanted to make a, a theory for this, uh, this transition. And um, I want to just very briefly remind you of the logic of phase transitions as they were in equilibrium statistical mechanics. So if you're looking at, say, a magnetic system, we know that there's a, a, a hierarchy of levels of description of which uh, all of them except uh, uh, the, the Landau theory are more or less uh, obscure and, and in, in, intractable, unless in, in the case of the Ising model, you're in two dimensions, there's no external magnetic field and your name is Onsaga. But other than that, it's very difficult to make progress. But uh, by writing down Landau theory and doing a renormalization group, one can uh, indeed uh, understand this problem. Now, what uh, we know is that near the transition, uh, the magnetization as a function of temperature at zero external field goes to zero in a singular way, uh, with uh, controlled by weak, uh, very weak, uh, asymptotically weak, uh, long wavelength modes. Whereas if I look at um, at the critical transition temperature itself in an external magnetic field, I find that uh, linear response theory breaks down and the magnetization induced by an external field H is not proportional to that field, but goes as some power. And what Widom just uh, pointed out and, and Kadanoff explained with his uh, block spin scaling constructions is that in fact, this uh, can uh, follow from a similarity of formula like here, which we now understand from the normalization group perspective. And here are experimental data for five different magnetic materials plotted in the way that the theory predicts and the uh, no parameters uh, uh, universal scaling function curve uh, shown goes through the data with no adjustable parameters like this. And so this is a great uh, success of, uh, of the Landau theory or the Ising model, the renormalization group approach. Um, it's a model that gives a precise uh, prediction in agreement with experiment. But in actual fact, this is a model of a model of a model of a model of a model, because we have a whole sequence of uh, models here, uh, each of which are related to each other by completely non-systematic and unjustifiable approximations. But through the magic of the normalization group and relevant operators and things like this that we now well understand, uh, even though these approximations are non-systematic and we can't derive any of these things from first principles, uh, nevertheless, uh, we get precise uh, predictions in agreement with experiment. So the question that we were trying to understand was not how to solve the transition to turbulence from the point of view of Navier-Stokes equations or kinetic theory of, of, of the atoms, but really what is the analogs of Landau theory and what is the renormalization group universality class. And uh, I, I'm going to go through this story very quickly um, because we've heard some of the highlights already from, from Bjorn and now we'll hear some others from uh, Dwight perhaps, uh, perhaps later. In order to understand those long wavelength collective modes that give you the, the phase transition behavior, um, we looked uh, for such modes in the Navier-Stokes equations simulating in a domain of 20 pipe, puff di puff pipe diameters, um, a single puff, to try to look at the uh, interplay of, um, of modes that uh, 
uh, um, restrain the turbulence and eventually which turbulence overcomes and uh, becomes uh, developed as you go through the transition. And to cut a long story short, uh, what we found was a, an emergent mean flow, which we called a zonal flow, because in, in this uh, geometry, it basically is, it has no uh, Z dependent by the way that it's is cre it's created here. Uh, this is a, an azimuthal flow that uh, interacts with the uh, small scale turbulence in a way that is reminiscent of a predator prey process. Primarily, what it does is it inhibits a turbulence and, and turbulence itself activates uh, this mode. And we, we know that because one can write down uh, from the Reynolds uh, equations, uh, sort of mean field equation for the uh, azimuthal velocity. And one finds that it is uh, given by the radial gradient of the, the velocity fluctuations, the, the Reynolds stress. So what's happening here is that the turbulence is inducing uh, this weak mean flow which then uh, shears and suppresses the turbulence, isotropizes it, and by isotropizing it, it, it makes this term smaller. Uh, that then, of course, reduces the turbulence, which then reduces the zonal flow itself, and so then the turbulence is then able to be excited. And, and that is completely reminiscent to the sort of cycle that you get in an activator inhibitor system, such as a predator-prey uh, ecosystem. So, so now the question is, all right, if that's what's going on, if those are the important uh, uh, modes at the transition, um, at least for a single puff, uh, and I'll come to the case of, of multiple puffs later, then how would one, one model that? Now, the way a statistical mechanician uh, models um, a predator-prey system is by saying, well, if I have predator and prey individually wandering around in an ecosystem, uh, what happens to them is that they interact through a variety of interactions, such as A being the predator and B being the prey. This one here means that a predator meets the prey. In this case, the predator is the zonal flow which suppresses turbulence. The prey is the turbulence. And then something happens, it eats it, and uses the energy gained to make more copies of the, of the predator. So A plus B goes to A plus A. And one can write down all the reactions that describe the basic processes in such an ecosystem system. And that's necessary in order to reproduce the phenomenon of, uh, of uh, population cycles in, in the system. And why the deterministic description is not adequate is an is, is interesting story that involves anomalies and all sorts of things which I'm not going to have time to go into. So when you now try to take that same picture uh, for, for turbulence and write down the, the wild diagrams, the analog of Feynman diagrams for Navier-Stokes equations for these mean flow, emergent mean flow uh, turbulent interactions, because of the quadratic nonlinearity in the equation of motion, the only diagrams that you can get are these, and these have the following uh, predator-prey uh, interpretation. These are like wave uh, uh, picture. This is like a, a particle picture here. So now we have a, a mapping between the important modes at the transition, uh, asymptotically close to the transition, and uh, a, a, a potential um, Landau theory for the transition. So what does it help us understand? So I'm going to show you now that it recapitulates the phase diagram and gives you the lifetime statistics and predicts the universality class. So the analog of the uh, Reynolds number the, the, in, in the pipe flow turns out to be the prey uh, birth rate in this uh, predator-prey e ecosystem. If the prey birth rate is too slow, then everything just dies and you're essentially in what is the analog of the laminar state. If the prey birth rate is fast enough, then you can get coexistence as you have over here. And so one can work out the, uh, the, the phase diagram and one can uh, look at the, uh, the world lines of spatially extended regions, puffs, of predator and prey, uh, where the red here is the prey uh, uh, population, the red here in the experiments is the turbulent intensity. One sees again the splitting phase, the slight differences between these diagrams, which I will go into uh, if I have time at the end. But uh, one can then ask the following questions. Uh, if we can reproduce uh, the phenomenon of a decaying uh, spatial structure and a splitting spatial structure. What are the statistics of the extinction times and the times between the population splitting events in this uh, ecosystem uh, land health? Area? And uh, what you find is that uh, you, the, the lifetimes and, and as a function of the control parameter uh, mimic exactly uh, what you see in the experiments on, 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 on pipes as shown here. 
So what we've understood then is that the death of turbulence is analogous to the extinction transition in this, uh, in this ecosystem. Now, I'm not going to go through the mathematics of this, but basically, once you've got this two fluid model here, uh, one can then work out from statistical mechanics what the universality class is. It turns out that it, you, it goes through the Regian field theory and ends up being in the universality class of directed percolation. And Bjorn uh, showed you these very beautiful experiments, both in quasi one dimensional Taylor Coet and in two dimensional Taylor Coet, showing uh, agreement uh, with the directed percolation uh, universality class. These predator prey dynamics are observed also in turbulent flows. Here I'm showing you data from a, a, a tokamak uh, where they occur near the LH transition. You also see them in, uh, in two dimensional uh, um, electroconvection experiments. So uh, now I've told you about transitional turbulence, and I want to now move on to my next topic, which is fluctuations and dissipation. Now, back in, in 1933, uh, Nikoladze did a, a, a very important experiment, which has unfortunately never been repeated. Uh, he took pipes and uh, he asked the following question. What is the frictional drag that turbulence experience as it goes through a pipe? And he didn't just make smooth pipes. What he did was he uh, glued sand grains to the walls of the pipes, and so he could vary the wall roughness. And what he measured was the pressure drop normalized by the kinetic energy density, rho u squared, and that's called the, the friction factor. What he found was that the friction factor as a function of Reynolds number followed this very non-monotonic uh, set of curves shown over here. Now he was doing this with pipes that were rough and pipes that were smooth. So the smoother pipes, of course, had the smaller friction. And so those are the ones at, at, at the bottom here. And as you increase the roughness of the pipes, uh, the friction factor follows the curves that, that I'm showing you here. Let's take a look at the anatomy of these curves. First of all, in this regime, uh, which is below about a, a, a several thousand or so, uh, you see that the friction factor goes down as one over Reynolds number. Well, that's because it's really Stokes drag, so it's proportional to the velocity, i.e. proportional to the Reynolds number, but it's normalized by rho u squared, and that's why you get the inverse Reynolds number in these units. Then something happens, and that something is the transition to turbulence that I just was just telling you about. And then you can see that as you uh, look uh, uh, above that transition and measure the friction, you see that the smoother the pipe is, the further down this curve that I'm showing you with a pointer, uh, the friction factor goes. And then what happens is the friction factor at some Reynolds number departs from that line, uh, undergoes this, uh, this spoon shape, and then eventually at large, uh, at large Reynolds numbers becomes independent of Reynolds number and only dependent on roughness. And this slope here, this line here is called the Blasius regime. And this line is asymptotically uh, as, the, as, you, as the pipe gets smoother and smoother, going as Reynolds to the minus a quarter. On the other hand, if I look at the scaling with roughness here, that goes as roughness to the one third, and that's called this strict regime. So the question is, is this evidence of a critical phenomenon, and why might you think that it would be? Well, I'm not really going to answer why I might think it, it might be, but uh, let me just go back to this diagram that I'd shown you, I'd shown you earlier. So we talked about these, uh, these phenomena here, and we talked about these two, stylized, these two stylized facts, the order parameter and the critical isotherm. And you can look at those stylized facts, and you can translate them uh, as, as into, into, this, into this language here, that these Blasius and Strickler uh, laws are very analogous to these to the stylized facts for the magnetization and the critical isotherm. So now let's talk about how one might relate this to turbulence. Now, as everybody knows, the energy spectrum in turbulence uh, is very close to uh, k to the minus five thirds of Kolmogorov law. Uh, if I'm, that's a mean field result, of course. Uh, if I look at a phase transition in the Ising universality class, uh, the uh, correlation function, at least in mean field theory, also is a power law, so we all understand that. But there's also the large scale thermodynamics, which has this data collapse that I showed you a few minutes ago. So my question is, what is the analog of the data collapse uh, for turbulence? What is the analog of the Widom scaling? And there's the Widom scaling for magnets. What is it for turbulence? So I'm not going to go through the long chain of arguments uh, that you can find in my, in my paper, uh, 
uh, and references are over here, but basically the answer is that these data can all be collapsed uh, with the theoretical justification uh, with this functional form here, and here is the data collapse plotted by Amerafarin and Portolami, who were able to infer from the data collapse the uh, intermittency uh, correction that it, it, to um, K41, the large-scale intermittency, a small uh, anomalous uh, dimension, anomalous scaling of about 0.02, and showing how these, these data collapse with, with this particular uh, functional form. And the theoretical reasons for that are really completely the analog of uh, Katanov's block spin uh, argument. So now we've understood uh, these, uh, the, the, the filled in this diagram here. And so now my question is, does it, um, can we see this experimentally? Can we make an experimental prediction? Now, before I show you the experiments, I want to make the point that this is a really beautiful and uh, remarkable finding, because here we are in 1933, where it's simply measuring the pressure drop across a pipe. And yet, eight years before Komogorov guessed mean field theory scaling, uh, Nikolazzi had inadvertently uh, measured the anomalous uh, scaling exponents uh, of turbulence. And, um, you know, this is exactly analogous to determining uh, anomalous critical exponents in phase transitions for measurements of the MH scaling at TC. And it's mathematically exactly analogous to that. So I, I, I kind of think of myself as being very fortunate as being perhaps the first physicist who knew something about critical phenomena to you know, look at these experimental data and have the opportunity to uh, make this connection. Now, this connection then is connecting the velocity fluctuations at small scales and their intermittency correction to the friction. And so this is a sort of fluctuation dissipation relation. And uh, my colleagues at uh, Illinois, uh, Gustavo Joya and Pinaki Chakraborty, uh, in a back to back physical review that was to my paper, uh, made a, a sort of heuristic mean field argument to try to calculate uh, the, where the Blasius and scaling exponent, uh, Blasius and Strickler scaling exponents come from. And I'm not going to rehearse their arguments here, but the bottom line is that the result is that the friction factor ends up scaling like this integral here of the energy spectrum, where this cutoff is some combination of the roughness scale and the Kolmogorov scale. So when you uh, plug in the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the numbers, this gives you, the, the, you know, the, the, say, the Kolmogorov spectrum, for example, you recover the Blasius and Strickland. Now, what we did was we realized that in 2D, uh, there were two uh, cascade, there's the uh, N plus energy one, which is an energy, and so therefore has the energy spectrum k to the minus five thirds, as in 3D. But it also there is this forward cascade of entropy, which up to logarithms has a, has a dependence, E of k goes as k to the minus three. So because the, this formula uh, just depends on the energy spectrum, then one can calculate what should be the friction factor um, in the 2D entropy cascade or in the 2D inverse cascade. And, uh, and that's what we did in, and simulated it in this paper over here. And uh, later, uh, a little bit later, we, uh, we teamed up with Hamid Kale and uh, the late Walter Goldberg to measure these uh, things in 2D soap forms. So here is a schematic of the apparatus. Here is a photograph of the actual apparatus. What you're looking at is a soap film held between nylon wires uh, and then uh, with boundaries that are these sort of saw blade like things here. You inject fluid into the, into the flow uh, with little particles. You bounce laser light off them so you, you can do um, a laser Doppler velocity symmetry and you can measure the velocity profile and wall stress. Here is a, in the, a picture of this geometry here. You can see the vortices generated. And here is the energy spectrum that was detected. And you can see uh, a K to the minus three scaling as you, uh, as, as you uh, might expect if you had an entropy cascade. If you use this geometry, in fact, where you have one rough wall and you measure uh, near the smooth wall, uh, you find that you have um, a, an inverse energy cascade which scales as K uh, to the minus five thirds. So now that we've created these two different cascades, it remains to ask, well, what is the friction factor in these two different regimes? So here are the data, and uh, here is the friction factor as a function of Reynolds number. Uh, the blue curves, the blue data points, represent the inverse energy cascade, and scale is minus one quarter exponent, as predicted. And the red is the forward entropy cascade, and scales as Reynolds to the minus a half, as we would have expected. Uh, based on this uh, statistical mechanical uh, type of prediction. 
just in the last year or so, Kelly and Hinaki Chakraborty extended these experiments so that they could measure not just the Blasius regime, but also the Strickler regime. So here is the friction factor as a function of roughness in the entropy cascade regime. And you can see that the predicted exponent is one. And they also, it's not in the paper, but they also uh, tried the uh, data collapse that we had predicted. And you can see again that uh, this uh, data collapse, the analogal Widom scaling uh, for uh, phase transitions uh, also applies in these 2D uh, uh, turbulent flows. So what I've shown you then uh, is that the drag experience at large scales uh, reflects the very nature of the turbulent state at smaller scales. And we've made two predictions, both of which were confirmed uh, experimentally. So that was, that was my uh, take home message. Uh, I want to end with Mitchell. So in Mitchell's, uh, in Mitchell's beautiful article about cows, which he seems to have been uh, obsessed with perhaps, um, uh, he talks about cardinality, he talks about counting, and uh, he makes the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, remarkable uh, idea, the remarkable statement, that numbers are firmly attached to the nature of human experience on Earth and surely are not platonic in nature. Most people wouldn't have, have said it quite that way, and I, I encourage you to read the article to see why he thought that. Uh, he says the symbolic content of numbers, and numbers were very important to Mitchell, Remember, he made his seminal uh, discoveries by just poking around on a Hewlett Packard calculator, most famously. So, the symbolic content of numbers is different from and additional to its abstractions, but it is clearly the catalyst of the desire to count, which has resulted in the conception and construction of these abstractions. And uh, Mitchell was somebody who does very much desired to count in more ways than one, and he did. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>